2022 bar questions and answers in political law. Number one, a police officer saw Harvey urinating in public. A local ordinance imposes a 500 peso fine for urinating in public. The police officer shouted at Harvey, that's against the law. Harvey sarcastically answered, no, this is against the law. Then and there, the police officer arrested him and brought him to the police station. At the police station, Harvey was frisked and was found in possession of an unlicensed 30 caliber revolver loaded with five live ammunition. He was subsequently charged with qualified illegal possession of firearms. When the prosecution offered in evidence the unlicensed firearm and ammunition, the defense objected on the ground that the pieces of evidence are products of an illegal search and seizure. The prosecution contended that the pieces of evidence were lawfully seized after a valid warrantless search incidental to a lawful arrest. Was the search and seizure valid? Five points. Answer is no. The search and seizure is invalid. In the case of U.S. versus F. Alexander, the right to arrest without a warrant for violation of municipal ordinance is given by statute to an officer. Where the ordinance merely provides for a penalty such as in this case, an arrest cannot be made thereby. There is no valid warrantless search and seizure incidental to a lawful arrest since the arrest in itself is invalid. Hence, the search and seizure is invalid. Number two. Pedro was the accused in a rape case. During the trial, the private complainant testified that on the night of the incident, she was walking home when Pedro, who was her neighbor, suddenly grabbed her and brought her to his house. There, Pedro forcibly and had carnal knowledge of her. After the prosecution rested its case, Pedro testified that the sexual intercourse between him and the private complainant was consensual. Eventually, the trial court acquitted Pedro on reasonable doubt and found that the element of force was not established. The people filed a Rule 65 petition for certiorari with the Court of Appeals, alleging that the trial court's decision was rendered with grave abuse of discretion because the private complainant's testimony clearly established that Pedro had carnal knowledge of her through force and without her consent. In his comment, Pedro sought to dismiss the petition on the ground of violation of his right against double jeopardy. As the CA, how would you rule on the petition? Answer, the petition has no merit. As a general rule, a judgment of acquittal is final, unappealable, and immediately executory upon its promulgation. Likewise, no person shall be twice put in jeopardy of punishment for the same offense. Although a judgment of acquittal may be assailed by the people in a petition for certiorari under Rule 65 of the Rules of Court without placing the accused in double jeopardy, however, in such case, the people is burdened to establish that the court of court acted without jurisdiction or grave abuse of discretion amounting to excess or lack of jurisdiction. Here, the court of court acquired jurisdiction over the case and made a judgment of acquittal therewith, based on reasonable doubt. There is no grave abuse of discretion amounting to excess or lack of jurisdiction in this case for certiorari to lie. Hence, such petition violates the right of the accused against double jeopardy, for the state is not allowed to make repeated attempts to convict an individual after a judgment of acquittal by tribunal highlighting his right of repose. Number three, a city ordinance was passed providing for the removal at the owner's expense of one, all outdoor advertising materials displayed or exposed to the public in designated regulated areas such as residential zones, bridges, and along main city streets, and two, billboards of substandard materials or which obstructs road signs and traffic signals. Failure to comply with said ordinance authorizes the mayor, assisted by the police, to implement the removal of the non-compliant materials. ABC Ad Agency 
owner of the billboards removed by the city filed a complaint because, considering the nature of its business, the removal of its billboards amounted to taking of private property without just compensation. Will the complaint prosper? No, the complaint will not prosper. In the case of Churchill versus Rafferty, although these billboards are located in private property, the real and sole value of the billboard is its proximate to the public thoroughfares. Here, considering the nature of its business where the purpose of advertising is for the public to see, considerations such as the grounds imposed under the subject ordinance is valid for it is for the general welfare of the public as this refers to designated, regulated areas and substandard materials. Regulation of billboard is not so much a regulation of private property, but a regulation of the streets and other public thoroughfares. Hence, removal of billboards does not amount to taking of private property without just compensation. It is the mere regulation of the streets and other public thoroughfares. Four, this item has two questions. As a reaction to China's occupation of the Sprutley Islands, a rally was organized by various civil society agrupations at a vacant private lot. Before the event could even start, the police ordered the organizers not to proceed with the program because of security reasons and the fact that the group did not have a mayor's permit. When the organizers still proceeded with the rally, the police dispersed the crowd and arrested the leaders of the group. Letter A, did the actions of the police constitute a violation of the group's constitutional right to peacefully assemble? B, would your answer be the same if the rally was held at the Freedom Park? Answer to letter A, yes. The action of the police is a violation of the group's constitutional right to peacefully assemble. BP 880 provides that no permit shall be required if the public assembly shall be done or made in a freedom park duly established by law or ordinance or in private property, in which case only the consent of the owner of the one entitled to its legal possession is required. Here, a mere statement of security reason is insufficient to justify the act of the police officers, and since mayor's permit is unnecessary if the rally is done in private property, the same may be dispensed with. Thus, the police violated the people's right to peacefully assemble as the assembly or the assembly was done within the bounds of law. Letter B. Yes, my answer would be the same. As a general rule, a written permit shall be required for any person or persons to organize and hold a public assembly in a public place. However, no permit shall be required if the public assembly shall be done or made in a freedom park duly established by law or ordinance. In this case where it is done in a freedom park, a mayor's permit would no longer be necessary to peacefully assemble. Thus, the act of the police officer is still a violation of the right to peacefully assemble as the same was done within the bounds of law. 5. The K-12 law was passed with the objective to enhance the Philippine educational system by strengthening its curriculum and adding two years of high school. Parents of students in a science high school sought to have the law declared unconstitutional, citing the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. As well, the parents averred that the law should not apply to their children because the latter belong to a distinct class, being gifted and advanced for their age, with the capability to learn better and faster compared to other high school students. Answer. A question is the contention of the parents tenable answer is no the contention of the parents is not tenable the equal protection clause is directed principally against undue favor and individual or class privilege it merely requires that all persons shall be treated alike under like circumstances and conditions both as to privileges conferred and liabilities enforced a class may be treated differently from another where the groupings are based on reasonable and real distinctions, germane to the purpose of the law, concerns members of the same class and applies to present and future conditions. Apparently, 
the unjustified claims of the parents that their children are gifted just because they are in a science high school and that they are to be treated beyond the scope of the law is not a reasonable and real distinction. Likewise, it is not germane to the purpose of the law, which is to treat or treat children alike in like circumstances and to avoid undue favor an individual or class privilege. Gifted children, if determined, is treated differently, but the law refers and applies to the general public of which these children belongs. Hence, the parents' contention is not tenable. Number six, President Hidalgo, who wanted the Philippines to be part of the International Criminal Court once again, signed the Philippines' ratification of the Rome Statute. A copy of the treaty along with the ratification was sent to the Senate for its concurrence. Senator Delisay filed a proposed resolution for the Senate to concur with the Philippines' ratification. The proposed resolution was read three times on three separate days. Three days before the third reading, printed copies of the proposed resolution in its final form were distributed to all the senators. The senators then unanimously approved this resolution, and the Senate expressed its concurrence with the treaty's ratification. A civil society group filed a petition before the Supreme Court questioning the validity of the Senate's concurrence on the ground that the resolution was void because only a bill becomes law. Rule on the petition. The petition has no merit. A simple resolution deals with matters entirely within the prerogative of one house of Congress, such as adopting or receiving its own rules. A simple resolution is not considered by the other chamber and is not sent to the president for his signature. Like a concurrent resolution, it has no effect and force of a law. Simple resolutions are used occasionally to express the opinion of a single house on a current issue. Oftentimes, it is also used to call for a congressional action on an issue affecting national interest. Here, the Senate expressed their concurrence validly through the approval of the subject resolution. It merely expressed the opinion of the single house, in this case the Senate, on the concurrence of the treaty's ratification. It does not stand to become a law requiring the members of the Senate to concur to begin with, which would otherwise be mandatory in nature. Hence, the petition should be dismissed. Number seven, after martial law was declared over Mindanao, police officers arrested Jose Maria without any warrant while shopping for groceries at a supermarket in Mindanao. Jose Maria questioned the validity of the arrest as he had no pending case and was not committing any crime at the time of his arrest. The police officers countered that the declaration of martial law suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and as a result, they could effect warrantless arrest. Is the contention of the police officers correct? The answer is no. The contention of the police officer is incorrect. Martial law and suspension of habeas corpus does not suspend the operation of the Constitution. Accordingly, the Bill of Rights remains effective under a state of martial law. Its implementers must adhere to the principle that civilian authority is supreme over the military and the armed forces is the protector of the people. They must also abide by the state's policy to value the dignity of every human person and guarantee full respect for human rights. In this case, Jose Maria should not be arrested without a warrant of arrest, and the same does not fall within Rule 113, Section 5 of the Rules of Court, on warrantless arrest because he is not caught in flagrante delicto committing a crime. It is not a situation of hot pursuit and he is not an escapee. Hence, the arrest is illegal. Number eight, a law was passed exempting the land bank of the Philippines from the payment of filing fees in collection cases on loans granted by LBP to its borrowers. The Office of the Court Administrator, or OCA of the Supreme Court, issued a memorandum requiring all courts to continue to collect filing fees in collecting or collection cases filed by LBP, stating that only the Supreme Court can decide on exemptions from payment of filing fees. 
LBP assailed OCA memorandum, arguing that the exemption found in the law is within the plenary power of Congress to enact legislative or legislation. Moreover, the law was approved by the president. Thus, LBP argues that the act of the OCA violates the principle of separation of powers. Is LBP correct? No, LBP is incorrect. The separation of powers among the three co-equal branches of the government has erected an impregnable wall that keeps the power to promulgate rules of pleading, practice, and procedure within the sole province of the Supreme Court. In this case, the OCA memorandum does not violate the principle of separation of powers as the Congress could not have carved out an exemption to LBP from payment of filing fees without transgressing another equally important institutional safeguard of the court's independence, that is, fiscal autonomy. Hence, LBP is incorrect. Number nine. During a press conference, President Acosta explained that the executive department can temporarily take over the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected by public interest to address the shortage of hospital beds occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. She invokes Article 12, Section 17 of the 1987 Constitution, which provides that in times of national emergency, when the public interest so requires, the state may, during the emergency and under reasonable terms prescribed by it, temporarily take over or direct the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest. So is President Acosta correct? The answer is no. Under the Constitution, the President could validly declare the existence of a state of national emergency but the exercise of emergency powers, such as taking over a privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest, requires a delegation from Congress. In this case, the executive department cannot solely temporarily take over the said operation since there is no delegation from Congress. Whether or not the president may exercise such power is dependent on whether the Congress may delegate it to him pursuant to a law prescribing the reasonable terms thereof. Hence, the President Acosta is incorrect. Number 10. Lim Well was born in 1988 a Filipino mother to a Filipino mother and an American father, as shown in his birth certificate. His parents, however, were not married to each other. Subsequently, his father petitioned for him. As a result of which, Lim Well received a certificate of American citizenship and an American passport. In 2022, Limwell filed a certificate of candidacy to run as representative of the Lone District of Batanes. Ayla, a Filipino citizen and resident of Batanes, filed a petition for disqualification with the Commission on Elections, alleging that Limwell is ineligible to run for public office in the Philippines as Limwell is an American citizen. Is Ayla correct? Answer is no. Ayla is incorrect. A certificate of citizenship does not grant citizenship. It does only recognizes and confirms the citizenship status already obtained by the applicant. Further, in the case of McKilling v. Comelec, the use of the foreign passport is the positive and voluntary act of representation as to one's nationality and citizenship. In this case, Limol is still a Filipino citizen. A mere grant of certificate of American citizenship does not ipso facto alter his citizenship and obtaining a foreign passport without its use does not alter one's nationality and citizenship as well. Thus, Limwell is still eligible to run for public office in the Philippines as he remains a Filipino citizen. Number 11. The Commission on Higher Education directed higher education institutions to remove materials that contain pervasive ideologies of communist terrorist groups from their libraries. According to the CHED, the materials need to be removed because these would radicalize students against the government. Is the CHED directive a violation of the institution's academic freedom? Yes, the CHED directive is a violation of the institution's academic freedom. Article 14 of the Constitution guarantees academic freedom, which includes 
the right of the school or college to decide for itself its aims and objectives and how best to attain them free from outside coercion or interference, save possibly when the overriding public welfare calls for some restraint. Here, it is merely presumptive that materials containing pervasive ideologies of communist terrorist groups will radicalize students against the government. There is no cogent proof that it will override public welfare that would call such restraint. Thus, it is a violation of the institution's academic freedom. 12. The Congress passed a law prohibiting the sale and distribution of alcoholic drinks within 100 meters from religious and educational institutions. A city enacted an ordinance increasing the coverage of the prohibition to 100 meters from any religious and educational institution. Is the city ordinance valid? Yes. The city ordinance is valid as it is regulatory in nature. In SJS versus Atienza, for an ordinance to be valid, it must only be within the corporate powers of the LGU to enact and be passed according to the procedures prescribed by law. It must also confirm to the following substantive requirements that it must not contravene the Constitution or any statute, must not be unfair or oppressive, must not be partial or discriminatory, must not prohibit but may regulate trade, must be general and consistent with public policy and must not be unreasonable. It cannot be said that the prohibition is unfair or oppressive to the sellers since they are still allowed to sell beyond the 150 meter limits and the ordinance did not prohibit trade since it is mere regulatory in nature in respect for religious and educa educational institutions. All others are complied with. Hence, the ordinance is invalid. Number 13. Pursuant to a law ordering the fixing of just and reasonable standards, classifications, regulations, practices, or services to be furnished, observed, and imposed by operators of public utility vehicles, the Land Transportation Franchise and Regulatory Board, or LTFRB, promulgated and published a regulation that no car beyond six years shall be operated as a taxi. Taxi operators assailed the validity of the regulation contending that procedural due process was violated because position papers were not asked of them and no notice was given to them prior to the issuance of the regulation. Were the taxi operators denied procedural due process? Answer is no. The taxi drivers were not deprived of procedural due process, rather, they were denied substantive due process. Procedural due process consists of two basic rights of notice and hearing, as well as the guarantee of being heard by an impartial and competent tribunal, while substantive due process requires the intrinsic validity of the law, interfering with the rights of the person to leave, liberty or property. Firstly, in this case, there was publication of the law, which is a sufficient notice to the public. Secondly, position papers are not necessary since this is not a pending case before judgment. It is to be rendered. Rather, substantive due process has been violated since the law interferes with the right of the people to live, liberty, and property. That is their livelihood. Hence, the taxi drivers were not deprived of procedural procedures, but of substantive due process instead. Number 14. A foreign commercial ship was spotted by the Philippine Coast Guard dumping garbage and toxic waste 20 nautical miles from Nasugbu, Batangas, the nearest coastline of the Philippines. The officers of the ship were arrested and charged in the regional trial court of Batangas for violation of environmental laws of the Philippines. The officers of the ship filed a motion to dismiss the case on the ground that Philippine courts do not have territorial jurisdiction over the case since the vessel was sailing outside the territorial sea of the Philippines when the arrest was made. Is the ground to dismiss correct? No. The ground to dismiss is incorrect. In contiguous zones, the coastal state may exercise the control necessary to prevent infringement of its laws, 
among others. Sanitary laws and regulations within its territorial or territorial sea. The contiguous zone may not extend beyond 24 nautical miles from the baseline. Clearly, the dumping of the garbage and toxic water waste was 20 nautical miles from the baseline. Therefore, although it is outside the territorial sea, it is within the contiguous zone wherein the coastal state may exercise control and that is to arrest the responsible officers of the said act for violation of the coastal state's environmental laws. Hence, the ground to dismiss is incorrect. Number 15. This item has two questions. Philippine Medical Center, or PMC, is a government hospital created by law to provide health care to the general public, especially the less fortunate. To enable PMC to perform its mandate, the national government provided the initial capital, land, buildings, and equipment to PMC. PMC's charter also authorized it, acting through its Board of Trustees, to acquire property, to enter into contract, to mortgage, encumber, lease, sell, convey, or dispose of its properties, and to do other acts necessary to accomplish. Among the properties of PMC are five lands and buildings located in Quezon City. The Quezon City Assessory issued Notices of Assessment for Real Property Taxes RPT, against PMC's properties that are being leased to private concessionaires. According to the city assessor, PMC's properties leased to private entities are subject to RPT, or the real property taxes, because these properties are not being exclusively used for charitable purposes. PMC, on the other hand, claims that as a government instrumentality imbued with corporate powers, it is exempt from RPT. Letter A, is PMC liable for the assessed RPT over their leased properties? Explained briefly. Letter B, supposing PMC is correct that it is not liable for RPT, may the city assessor assess the lessee for the RPT due on PMC's leased properties? The answer to letter A, PMC is not liable for assessed RPT over the leased properties as it is a government instrumentality exempt from real property tax. As a general rule, government instrumentalities are exempt from real property tax. In the case of PHC versus Quezon City, it was held that the Republic and its instrumentalities returned their exempt status despite leasing out their properties to private individuals. The properties only lost the exemption from being taxed, but they did not lose their exemption from the means to collect such taxes. Here, PMC cannot be held liable for the assessed RPT as it remained a government instrumentality despite leasing the said properties to private individuals. Hence, PMC is not liable. Letter B. Yes, the city assessor may assess the lessee for the RPT done on PMS leased up properties. In the same case of PHC versus Kesson, it was held that the exemption does not extend to taxable private entities to which the beneficial use of the government instrumentality's properties has been vested. This leaves the city assessor to assess private individuals with beneficial use of PMC's properties for real property taxes. Thus, the city assessor may assess the lessees for RPT due on PMC's leased properties. Thank you again for your support, and though it is not required or mandatory, feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks.